Ourselves in the formation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm Augustus. Uh, I'm also Sam. <laughs> also Sam. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Ruas, thank you, Sam and Augustus, for inviting me to, 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 be the, to launch, I guess, the, the series and the experience of, and the inexperience of series. Um, I think, I think the, the student lecture series has always been like a really interesting and important part of any architecture school. It was a big part of me as a student when I was developing my impressionable ideas and you know, getting in, in, interested in other things outside of the school. Of course, I'm very much inside the school, so uh, hopefully at some point you also see um, things are happening um, outside the school. But I think what I'll be talking about today, um, I don't think I've presented before uh, here at Reading, which is my own uh, research. So yeah, it's just really good to be a part of this and uh, you know, have students in all three years chatting, you know, meeting each other, having the dinner. You know, it's all good. <laughs> um, so who am I? I mean, ordinarily, um, <clears throat> I guess the first years don't really know me that well. Um, obviously, I teach here at, at Reading in second years, the second years are probably sick of me by now, but I'm also doing a PhD at the Bartlett School of Architecture, and I guess the distinction between, I guess, my PhD and maybe other PhDs that you might be familiar with is that my um, research is by design, so it's design-driven, uh, which means that the methodology that I use is primarily drawing, uh, drawing as a tool for understanding and for, um, uh, for analysis and also design and architectural design as a valid form of uh, building knowledge. So what I'll be talking about today is, um, I guess I'll start off with a kind of conceptual overview of how I see drawing, uh, what, I, what, I kind of, um, what I value in the process of drawing, but then uh, zoom out, I guess I'll give you a quick reflection of my, my previous work as a student. Uh, so, you know, in there's some master students here, there's some undergrad students here. I'll quickly show you some of the work I did when I was a student and then see how that, and the reason I want to show you that is because I want to show how it's connected actually to my PhD research because I don't, I see my PhD as a real extension of the work I did right from when I was a third year student. So I don't necessarily think, well, maybe you're not necessarily going down the same field as, as I'm showing now, but what it might uh, present is that suddenly you start an undergrad in architecture school if you're really passionate about it, you can actually develop it at master's level and then further develop that uh, perhaps in research and PhD level and, and even beyond. So before I was teaching here, I, did, I was working at DRMM Architects. Um, I did my part one uh, at Edinburgh School of Architecture and my part two at the Bartlett. So I'm gonna talk, um, I kind of zoom out a bit and just talk about drawing and why I find drawing uh, a particularly interesting uh, line of inquiry when it comes to developing research and acquiring knowledge. 
Uh, and part of this is uh, my kind of idea that dra uh, architectural drawing and architectural representation are not the same thing. When we uh, communicate design, um, representation often implies that something already exists. So we're representing a finished building, we're representing something or, or a building or, or a design that's in, in, in process of being complete. Whereas architectural drawing, for me, is the, the idea of discovering something through drawing. So how we design uh, through thinking, how we communicate ideas in our minds through what we have, which is you know, either model making or, or sketching. And a big uh, reference and influence is um, the work of Carlo Scarpa. We can see here, uh, uh, those of you familiar with Scarpa's architecture, is all about the detail and how the detail of the design um, comes together. But the drawings produced aren't necessarily finalized, complete, static communications of this is how something is uh, produced. But you can really see in this uh, the actual thinking of the architect. Um, so using the drawing as a means of discovery rather than just as a static finished design. Um, Paul Emmons says that architectural drawing is a unique locus of active thinking, itself a wellspring of ideas where a design emerges from within the effort of drawing. Drawing is not only an aid to imagination, but the locus of invention is within drawing. So I'm really fascinated by the fact that when we, when we think about things and we're coming up with ideas with architectural design, we're thinking quite abstractly. It doesn't exist yet. It doesn't exist in the material world. And sketching and drawing is, is, is the, the, the most primary form of making that tangible. And obviously, then it, beyond, it goes beyond that and becomes physical and hopefully into the built environment itself. But the first place that it becomes tangible is, is the actual drawing. And I'm quite interested in the idea of the origins of what design, which is this term designio, which is concerned with the idea of architecture, not the matter of building. So the idea of architecture being a broader scope of, of the built environment and thinking about the design process as a process and not just as a means. So uh, architects like Eisenman use drawing as a means of design and the actual process of um, drawing kind of as an as a, as a, as a, as a invention in itself. Uh, a real uh, influence of mine is Ray Lucas, uh, who um, he talks a lot about uh, des design and drawing as a research tech, uh, methodology. And he says that drawing is not only an appropriate form of investigation, but one that allows for an entirely different form of knowledge to emerge. As architects, Design is our research methods. Um, we don't, architects don't always work in a university. They often work in practice and, and designing buildings and, and executing uh, projects you know, at various different scales across the, you know, across the world. But the way that they develop their knowledge is through the act of design. And often traditional uh, kind of academic fields uh, who use methodologies that I'm sure the third years are <laughs> getting to grips with, with their dissertations, you know, of different um, methodological apparatus to kind of produce research. Often design gets uh, kind of sidelined as not necessarily a valid form of producing and, 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 and developing knowledge. So I'm very much interested in, and this is some of Ray, Ray Lucas's work, I'm very pretty much interested in what happens when a design project is considered a valid form of research. My, uh, um, Penelope Haralambi, who's my PhD supervisor, um, uh, talks a lot about the idea that uh, in architecture, the object referred to by the drawing is delayed, leading to a slow blossoming of the design structure in the mind. So when we read architectural drawings, even if they're fairly conventional plans or sections, we are imagining the building as a physical three-dimensional space. Like slowly we are imagining something that's two-dimensional, that's flat, that's scaled, but we imagine a volumetric inhabitation of a real architecture. And I think that's quite fascinating with drawing because it provokes our imagination. And the practice of drawing is really important to me. Uh, Perry Copper says that the slow drawings are more comprehensive than the fast drawings. The drawings cultivate a world of ideas, spatial speculations. The drawing can be practiced as a design rehearsal in its own right. So the valid act of drawing is a, is a valid form of architecture, a valid form of experiencing design. This is a drawing by uh, my friend Kirsty, <coughs> Kirsty Badenoch, whose uh, work I think very much is captured by this quote by Human Kuligi, who says that imaginal drawings bridges the visible and the invisible and invites the viewer to inhabit a third world of the in-between. World making as we know it always starts 
from worlds we already know and hand. The making is a remaking. So how we only we draw anything, we, we're, building, we're, we're building worlds, we're building a version of architecture, a version of the built environment that doesn't quite exist yet, but always responds to something that does exist, which is a site or a kind of place. So we're kind of imagining a future when we do a proposal, right? We, we, we're imagining a version of the site that hasn't happened yet. And that's kind of fascinating, actually, when you think about it. We're kind of building parallel universes when, when we do our drawings. These are some uh, details of my own uh, kind of hand drawing. And I'm really interested in various forms of drawing, right? From hand drawing with our hands and pencils to kind of other forms of drawing with our cameras um, to other forms of drawings with our computers and they're all I th in my head kind of seamlessly integrated and have different qualities but um, Palasma I'm sure some of you are familiar with says that the pencil in the architect's hand is a bridge between imagining mind and the image that appears on the sheet of paper the image that appears as if it were an automatic projection of the imagining mind or perhaps the hand that really imagines so sometimes you might have an idea of what you're going to draw and you start drawing and it maybe becomes something completely different. Not only completely different, but it becomes something of its own accord. It has a mind of its own. And there's something quite interesting in that process as well. And tracing to me is really important. Um, tracing is a means of performing a drawing, a source to be reenacted. It opens the original source to invention and interpretation that the initial copying moves beyond replication. And you'll see in my uh, PhD, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, even my undergrad and my master's work, tracing and layering is a big part of a process of a kind of tackling and reinventing kind of the, the, existing, the existing place or site, but also the drawing itself as a site, so a drawing or, in my case, paintings as a site in themselves. So this is just a kind of research methods for architecture, the idea of copying and collaborating and drawing attention the use of drawing as a research method is very much a part of, of my, my, my process. Now I'm going to show you some student work, which is very old, um, but I think it's really helpful for you to kind of um, to see the connections maybe from my third year to my uh, fourth year, fifth year, and then to my PhD. So I was always interested in tracing. This is my undergraduate, uh, one of my uh, undergraduate drawings, uh, emerging you know, developing a form of um, responding to an existing place. This is an existing building in Edinburgh um, that I did a series of layered tracings of the, the, all the kind of possible versions of the um, previous plans for the building. So I kind of used tracing to kind of instill a form of drawing within plan and section um, through it, throughout its history. Um, <clears throat> in my masters, I went to Morocco, Tangier, and uh, walk the wall of the Medina, so the, the Medina wall, which separates the kind of uh, inner city and the Caspar from the outer city. And I was particularly interested in these moments and thresholds and traced the spaces, the, the Medina taxi rank and the um, watchtowers as a form of kind of learning from the site itself. Um, and then produced these uh, visualizations of. This, the space itself, you can see some remnants of the walls, but looking at time as a form of tracing. So I used color to separate two separate forms and two separate moments in time. So the, the, the orange and the green represent uh, a kind of a different time on configuration. And you can see the shadows on the ground uh, reflect those different time temporal modes. So these are kind of, um, you know, you can see before I was doing some hand tracing, developing that as a, as a technique of developing design. And these are more digital models that then are layered through um, CAD drawing and, and, and layering and, and Photoshop. But they become drawings that are layered through time and movement and space. That um, became a big interest of mine. Um, and then this is another one of my uh, pieces, which was looking at, um, I think, I guess this was looking at the still perspective, but uh, mul multiple times of the day, so different times and configurations of the same space. Whereas this was looking at the same space, but different perspectives. So moving through and around uh, the design structure. Um, <clears throat> so different, you can kind of make out these different perspectives of the same piece of architecture, but you, know, you can see in the background layered mappings of, so this is actually a bank I designed, and then you can see the mapping of, of 
the city of Copenhagen, which is where this project was cited, and the other banks that it was connected to. So it's kind of a composite drawing, I suppose, of different perspectives, but also its place in the city. And uh, throughout my undergrad uh, and my masters, I was really interested in uh, the kind of the limits of drawing. So uh, obviously, drawing does this implies something that we have in our minds, but we have to kind of follow a certain convention of how we draw, right? So perspective uh, puts us in one position and sees, shows us this is what you see when you're standing in this position. And I was quite frustrated with that. So that's why I picked the perspective but in multiple positions. So trying to kind of break the limits of the drawing. And uh, I was quite interested in, and still am with the axonometric and um, the fact that it's a viewpoint that is an all seeing, I guess, God's eye view of space because it's got this kind of aerial viewpoint where there's no kind of vanishing point, there's no fixed position, it's infinite, and uh, it kind of temporally kind of loose. So this is, a, on the left, it's a drawing that shows the kind of, I guess, the timeline of this building, uh, this bank being produced, being constructed. And then uh, a big, big part of my project was about using copper, because in Copenhagen, copper is a big part of the project, um, big part of the city, sorry. Um, and material is often a good register of time. So uh, obviously, copper goes from brown and red to green um, over time. So the different stages of this drawing was represented in one drawing that used color to indicate the new parts of the building and the old parts. So the old parts would go green, and the new parts would be kind of um, copper, copper brown, I guess. Um, so I kind of used uh, the conventions of drawing, like the axo or the perspective and tried to play and manipulate how they worked so that they told us something new and different about how the architecture emerged through time and through space. So throughout my undergrad and masters, I had a kind of a series of um, dissertations and theses of, 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 of written work that looked at uh, particularly the axonometric and its uh, kind of transformation. So, this is actually, I'm buying a waitlist, that's my undergraduate dissertation, and then these two written papers were um, part of my master's. And throughout all of them, I was always interested in the axonometric. Um, and the reason being is because I was quite interested in initially about the fact that uh, in modernism, the axonometric was kind of used to represent this floating fluid space of architecture that was seamless, um, and, and weightless in a sense that the digital movement and the Russian constructivist movement used the axonometric to kind of, um, kind of really highlight aspects of infinity and, 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 and the, the kind of break through the shackles of perspective and, and become fluid. And so I was really interested in how a form of drawing and imagining architecture that was floating and free created a type of architecture that was actually quite, um, uh, that was um, trying to kind of break, you know, the idea of corner windows and, and, and seamless uh, detailing in modernism was, is in part due to, due to how in which it was being envisaged. And then in the masters, I was really interested in the idea of, of power and how architectural drawing can be symbolic of power. So the axonometric is uh, used to kind of represent time, uh, but then also the idea of the God's eye view, which I mentioned before. So you, you're able to see things that others can't. They were used for drawings of fortifications because they were accurate and geometrically precise. Um, but you know, essentially, uh, you know, Scalari says, in war, no single, work, uh, no single view does not serve. The whole has to be shown. So the idea of seeing the whole, seeing everything from this kind of view from above really had these connotations of power. And then my final thesis really looked at the idea of the urban, the, the representation of the city and the kind of the communication of the city and how the axonometric in the representation of the city was kind of almost a, a kind of pro 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 proposal and the kind of the idea that how um, we, as a, as a master plan, drawing the city from above uh, really kind of communicates like this kind of axonometric view of, of, of curatorial and compositional um, tool sets. So, so you can see that there's been a thematic link from my undergraduate uh, to master's, I guess, drawing techniques, but also um, uh, my research in, into the axonometric and its various properties. So that's kind of led um, into my PhD research, which um, deals with 
the axonometric, but kind of more broadly termed parallel projection. And parallel projection is essentially a, any form of drawing that um, where their lines run parallel rather than uh, kind of in perspective where they run to a kind of single vanishing point. So parallel projection um, and the urban imagination of paintings of early modern Kyoto. Um, and just to kind of um, you know, contextualize this, I was really interested in how in, I guess, the West, the, the, the AXO or the parallel projection form of drawing was treated as this really precise and uh, objectively accurate form of representing space because, it, as many students should know, it conserves scale, it conserves dimension. You could use it to plot an idea of how something's uh, constructed in multiple dimensions. And that's led to why it was used in drawings of fortifications and also why it was used as a, uh, a tool of drawing things, how things were put together, how things were understood. So in the Western context, during the kind of, uh, I guess, the Renaissance, there was really this tool of rationality, tool of precision, and uh, kind of understanding how things were put together. But then towards the 20th century, as I mentioned before, it become the, the kind of more ambiguous properties of the drawing became kind of celebrated. So the fact that it was kind of fundamentally quite abstract to be representing space as if you're floating in the middle of the sky with no uh, horizon. Uh, and the, the fact that, you know, the ground in an axo is essentially removed, you know, because there's no way of representing the ground plane in an axo unless you start to start hatching everything in the direction of the paper. So the fact that it was this floating, free, uh, perceptively ambiguous, so you can't tell which is concave and which is convex from this perspective, that was celebrated as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, as, a, as an attribute of the drawing uh, in these paintings. And, and, and really kind of um, the ambiguity was a part of why they started to use this form of drawing. But that's a particularly Eurocentric perspective where the, under, the understanding of the tool of drawing became understood in the West from the Renaissance towards the 20th century. But in East Asia, the form of drawing that we can term parallel projection had been used for centuries um, in their painting. And the ambiguous temporal qualities, the kind of playful use of um, uh, kind of uh, modulating space and time has been used, you know, this is a uh, painting from the 10th century where it shows a character seamlessly moving from one scene to another. And the fact that it's used using power projection uh, allows that to happen. So for example, if it was in perspective, you wouldn't be able to show a character move through the same character appear in more than one scene because it would, would require multiple scenes to be created. So essentially these are kind of scrolls, hand scrolls, where you move through time just by moving along the scroll of the painting. Um, so that you can, you can sense time taking place and space is not interrupted, the view is not changing. So it's almost like a film that unravels. And, uh, you know, representations of the city uh, in, these, um, in these contexts, you know, started to imagine in, uh, started to appear in the West, you know, in, in the 1500s with this map of Venice. But you can see here from the 12th century, we're representing in, in Chinese painting in Zhang Zhidan's along the river during the Qing Ming Festival. So why am I talking about this? I'm basically interested in the East Asian context of the axonometric or the parallel projection, which has quite clearly been like really rooted in East Asia um, for many years and been understood uh, and been treated very differently to how it was treated in, in a Western architectural context. So um, this is a, a series of paintings called Rakuchi Rakukaisu. And they're paintings of the Kyoto um, in the 16th and 17th century. So Kyoto at the time was, was the capital of Japan. And these paintings uh, essentially were representing very much the city as a flourishing, um, thriving metropolitan capital. Um, and almost at the time, Kyoto was seen as like the beating heart of Japan as a whole. So, you know, the kind of, um, if you look very closely, you see the details of characters and figures going about their everyday lives, um, you know, uh, visiting um, shops, um, things like the Gion Festival, which you can see in that slide there. So it was very much a kind of representation, not just of the urban form of, of, of the city, but also of how it um, was lived and, and occupied by its users. And uh, <coughs> one of the kind of the interesting things about this is 
all of the things I'll be talking about, the axometric, how it shows the view from above, how it shows this um, ambiguous temporality, a view of power. They're all parts of this painting in the sense that they were curated and commissioned by you know, those of the political elite, um, creating these visions of the city for you know, a people who uh, had control and, and, and wanted control over the city and to establish authority and power. So I'm quite interested in the terminology of the types of representation here. Um, you can see that in the current context, in, in, it's, it's, it's been studied primarily in an art historical context, not from an architectural perspective. So my, my kind of investigation into the paintings is taking an architectural perspective that we have as architects in design and applying it to these paintings. So, you know, allowing um, us to kind of use the lens of, 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 of how we think of architectural drawing such a parallel projection to investigate the forms that are kind of inherent in these paintings. And you can see here, uh, Hideo Okadara calls, um, calls it a sashenbio, which is, means a bleak line depiction, but there's no real understanding um, of Western perspective um, that kind of emerges in East Asian art. The, the use of representation has always been this kind of um, fluid parallel projection, which you can see here, there's several moments where the, the laws of a, kind of a, kind of a, a typical parallel projection drawing in the West are kind of played with and manipulated, where we can see this face at an angle here. And then on this side, we can see this face so we're kind of simultaneously um, moving from different vantage points through the city. And the way that that's facilitated is through these gold clouds. And the gold clouds are really interesting because, you know, they, obviously they represent a phenomenological aspect of the city, which is the actual, gold cl uh, actual clouds that do hang low in the city. But there's no viewpoint that you can ever achieve anywhere in Kyoto that gives you this view. So it's very much a representation of how we imagine Kyoto, rather than how it actually appears. Um, so, the, you know, the gold clouds are kind of given this dreamlike quality to the paintings, but they also separate different parts of the city from each other. So, for example, um, you know, parts of um, famous landmarks are kind of shown very close to each other, uh, separated only by the gold cloud, whereas, you know, in reality, they'd be kind of geographically very distant. But because they've been kind of knitted together with this compositional device, they come across as being very um, dense and, 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 and kind of quite seamless. And the idea is that you sat in between these gold clouds, I'm oh, sorry, between these screens, so that you'd be almost kind of sat in this panorama of, of Kyoto. So it said seated, the viewer would find the Kutsu-sama and the house of Hokusama, which is these kind of... Um, uh, uh, kind of uh, aristocratic families, slightly below eye level, a comfortable height for viewing. So what that means is that how different buildings are positioned in the painting are depending on the status of their uh, architectural value. So this uh, red temple here is the Saiganji Temple, uh, which is actually a really small temple. I've been there. Um, and it's actually not as prominent in the city as it appears in these paintings. But through the use of manipulation of the perspective, you're getting a kind of dramatically different version of, of how the city is. So the artists were playing with representation to tell a certain story. You can see here the detail in the paintings where, you know, the figures are all unique. There's no repetition. And uh, David Hockney did this um, uh, film about the Chinese scroll where he shows that's his finger. So how much detail it goes into the painting. Um, to, to show the population moving through the space. And this is another kind of interesting moment here of where you can see this face of the bridge meeting that face of the building where you're simultaneously in opposite parts of the city at the same time. So I'm particularly interested in also in how they become these, almost these views of the city that are, you know, uh, essentially propaganda. Um, because it was produced in the period when the city was recovering from uh, a uh, civil war. So most of Kyoto had actually got burnt down at this point. So they were both kind of aspirational, but nostalgic. Um, you know, this idea that Kyoto was the heart of Japan and the paintings almost restored their status uh, or the city's status, because they were meant to be viewed not in Kyoto, but outside Kyoto. They were kind of almost given to military warlords that lived out in the kind of the provincial parts of Japan. 
So there's all sorts of kind of things about these paintings that I'm particularly interested in. But the first thing that I was that caught my eye was the idea of the kind of the gold cloud um, and the idea of the threshold of the city. You can see here that the, the inside and outside of the city is kind of connected um, through these forts and these gates. And you can see, you know, I was always interested in the kind of the gate to the city and the, the fort, um, the wall that protects the inside and the outside. But the gold cloud as a, as a viewing device um, had a quite interesting um, a, a kind of influence over me in terms of understanding how the parallel projection is being used and also how um, the, the forms of imagination that they provoke. So what, um, so I'll be just talking about these paintings and at the moment you might be thinking this is like an art history lecture. Um, but the reason why uh, I'm interested in these paintings is because from an architectural perspective, there's a lot of architectural information in the paintings, right? So uh, traditionally what uh, art historians do is they would look at, okay, what are the sketches of the paintings can I study uh, just to understand how the artist came up with the compositions or maybe there's some diaries that talk about their process but none of that exists all of that's been destroyed so the only thing that exists are the paintings themselves and many of the paintings have been have been lost so at the moment the analysis of the paintings is just by looking at the paintings so an architect obviously uses drawing as a way of um, learning things right so my perspective introduces a design context where I use the spaces of the paintings as sites uh, to inhabit and to understand and analyze. So a lot of my technique is um, using drawing as an inquisitive tool to understand um, how they become interesting uh, forms of practice. So these are some reference points that kind of um, refer Akira Yamaguchi, who's a quite famous artist who I met actually in Tokyo. Um, who uses the kind of language of these paintings to, to form, uh, to, not to form, to form his own uh, kind of uh, vistas. Although you can see here the gold cloud is used quite literally as a thing that covers the city rather than moves from one part, part of the city to another. Other people like Drawing Architecture Studio use the kind of the fluid language of parallel projection and Team Lab, which also use um, kind of parallel projection and aerial views to represent this kind of uh, temporal landscape. So these are kind of reference points, and I mentioned Penelope harrell own design research as well. Um, so again, reflective design is a big part of how I uh, um, treat these paintings and, and understand uh, information from them, uh, alongside other things like field work, ar archival work as well. Um, so this is uh, kind of the, one of the first studies I've, I've done. I mentioned the Saiganji temple. You can see here that the, the, the same temple in two different versions of the painting are drastically different in size. Um, even though the kind of reference point, the kind of uh, Sanjitangenda temple, which is on the right, which I'll talk about later, is the same size. So you can see that even though those temples there are the same size, the Saiganji temple is drastically different in this one, which means it's being prominently bigged up, I guess, as a... As, a, as an architectural gem. And you can probably deduce from that that it was commissioned by the Saganji Temple to kind of give it its, its kind of prominence in the city. So um, I mentioned the gold clouds, how they're kind of illustrative of like imagination, uh, how they uh, formed this uh, idea of how we imagine. And even in the Western world, gold clouds was kind of representing thought and ideas. And uh, I was quite interested in the idea of the gold cloud editing out parts of the city that I wanted to use drawing to imagine. So uh, this, what I did is I, I picked three panels of the painting and um, uh, I started to inhabit that as a space for me to draw as, a, as, a, as an architect. So uh, as an architect, but also as an artist as well. Um, essentially what, they, what I did was uh, analyze the space of the implied space behind the clouds. And a lot of this is possible because it was using parallel projection because the lines of projection kind of continue um, into the space of the cloud. So you can see here, this is like a, a breakdown of the cloud. Um, this kind of analysis of the existing painting in the space of the, the cloud. And then this kind of layering of my own space that continues and edits out parts of the painting. So in and of itself, it, it belongs to and is tied to the spaces around. You know, it's, it's tied to the, 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 the balustrades and the architectural detail that the painting is framing. But obviously, it's not defined by, it's not locked in. So it becomes my own uh, space at a certain point. So you can see here that these are some details 
where I imagine the space that's behind the cloud. I imagine a world that's kind of completed by the cloud. But obviously, as I mentioned before, the cloud isn't meant to be a physical part of the city. It's actually editing out parts. It's moving between one space to another. So by drawing and by filling in the space of the cloud, um, <clears throat> I'm kind of drawing what isn't ever there, what was never possible to be there. So it's a, it's a process of, uh, of analysis of, of, of the fact that the use of representation is being manipulated in certain ways in the painting. But also it's a, it's a space for design and for creativity where your imagination is, is provoked by the drawing and then I am using that imagination to instill my own uh, kind of version of the, of the paintings. Uh, so I think the next slide is taking a while to load. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'll just skip skip ahead. So you can see this is this um, this painting. This this study was a detailed and kind of explorative um, uh, exercise, and quite a long and took me quite a while to do. But um, the kind of slowness of drawing and the kind of the, the methodology, uh, kind of the, you know, the re repetition of, of some of these things, tells you a lot about the kind of the, the detail that the original artists went into in terms of building and constructing their own world, um, their own kind of design world of Kyoto. Because in a sense, the, the version of Kyoto that they present is a work of arch architectural fiction. It's not a kind of, it's not a literal version of Kyoto. It's a version of Kyoto that they constructed. So a lot of my drawings, my subsequent pieces have been um, about that. This is another study called uh, 33 Movements of Sanji Sangendo, which is that temple that I mentioned uh, before. And I was quite interested in looking at how this specific temple have been represented in different paintings. Uh, you know, so you can see that San Sangendo basically is uh, this really long uh, pagoda, it's temple, sorry, this really long temple uh, called, it's called 33 Movements because there's 33 columns and it was used for archery and it held, um, this is the actual, my site visit uh, actually to the temple. So it's, it's, I can't even get it in one photograph, you can see how long it is. Um, <clears throat> and essentially like even the paintings uh, try to hide the full ex extent of the painting by not showing it. So often half the building is kind of covered in, in the cloud or they, they haven't really drawn it to its full extent because it would seem really out of proportion. Um, but I was quite interested in understanding because this is one of the few buildings that is still intact from the time of the painting. So I was quite interested in the, the representation of the space. And inside the painting are these uh, thousand statues of, 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 of the canon. So I basically did a, a kind of a, a traced uh, composite layering of, of the different versions of the Santa Sangendo. It's a work in progress, but the idea is that by moving between different representations of the temple uh, and then also introducing the kind of the inside of the temple, these kind of uh, statues that I've um, and I'm, uh, <laughs> revealed from the inside to the outside, this kind of exploded kind of layered collage of how the, rep how the temple has been represented across the versions of the paintings. So this is just basically a series of tracings of the paintings, but by retracing, by redrawing the, pa the paintings, you're understanding something different about the temple and its identity. So this is basically a, a quick study. Um, this is a, another study called Under the Surface of Ikeda, um, which uh, is basically an act of reconstructing uh, the space of the painting. I mentioned before that the Painting has like architectural information, it has because an axonometric has scale and proportion and detail, you can actually reconstruct the painting. So you, I've made a digital model of the painting by uh, you know look, looking at the projection angle and deducing its depth. Um, and I think I'm quite interested in how the painting implies three-dimensional space, but doesn't kind of uh, it doesn't define it. So it implies that there's uh, a ground, but you don't actually know where the ground is. It's kind of implied there's no actual representation of the ground so I was quite interested in how if you start to look at the space of the painting as a literal reconstruction it becomes almost a vertical space where the painting exists in this vertical plane and the ground is this layer that comes behind it you can see these are the parts the gold in the background which is the ground and the cloud is kind of in front of the painting so I was interested in like the implication of depth within the painting and the representation of depth being quite manipulative in representation. So these are some stills from my 3D model, which then became this um, 
you know, this, this document of a new, a new AXO of an AXO, essentially, that I drew of um, the, my digital reconstruction. So essentially, I'm just redrawing the painting, but I've understood it from a completely different perspective. So we're drawing the same, we're drawing exactly the same space, but it's been represented in a completely different way. And the art of reconstruction is a, an art of tracing in itself, but then the art of um, understanding depth and the implications of depth and the varied um, tools of depth are quite interesting. And then I got quite interested in um, so these some details of that drawing, uh, kind of inhabiting the space of the painting uh, in a different kind of way. And this is it being uh, exhibited at uh, the Cartography's Imagination Project. I, I quite uh, also was quite interested in how, when we see these paintings, we want to imagine ourselves within them. So we want to imagine ourselves walking around like regular people. In fact, those little circles are representations of where people are in the painting. So they're kind of registering the kind of, I guess, the occupation. And because I've reconstructed the, the, the drawing as a three-dimensional model, I could occupy that as a three-dimensional space. So um, these are a series of drawings where I, I occupy that 3D model as a series of perspectives that essentially inhabit the world of the painting in, 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 in the way that it was intended to, but in a very kind of obviously very abstract way. So um, it's almost like bring, bringing the viewpoint into the painting, but in a way that obviously because there's only parts of the painting that are revealed, um, you know, you only see certain aspects of it. And this is the, one of the last projects um, I'm going to talk about, which is this uh, inside outside theater. So this is a study that I wanted to do to kind of, I guess, reconstruct my own version of the painting. Um, so this is some uh, of my field work in Kyoto when I went um, taking these photogrammetry scans of the uh, various parts of the uh, city. So this is a part in Kyoto of a Machia house, uh, which is now a restaurant. Machia housing is like a kind of typology of houses that are kind of dying in Kyoto. They're kind of a traditional townhouse. Um, and essentially, you can take, uh, you can make a 3D scan of anything if you take enough photographs um, and you use a certain software and it reconstructs a 3D scan of the building. So I went around and took lots of, <laughs> lots of, lots of photographs and built these uh, photogrammetry scans of, uh, of buildings, but of, of um, parts of shrines, um, little moments of um, the mature houses and the kind of the architectural build-up, but also kind of zooming out on to Google Earth and seeing how you can actually construct 3D scans by looking at, that's how Google Earth itself is produced through photogrammetry. Uh, and there's quite an obvious pun with the cloud space that is given by <laughs> the data, but there's something quite interesting about the idea that when we draw uh, axonometrics, we draw with lines, but when computers draw scans, they don't use lines, they use points, so it's more like paintings. Um, so I was quite interested in this idea that we only give spaces lines when we draw them, and actually no space really has lines at all. Um, which, when it comes to showcasing something in, in a parallel projection like this, there's no actual lines there at all, but you see, you see the lines of projection that are superimposed onto them. So this became like kind of a, again, this is me giving the, these, these fragments uh, of these scans lines. This became uh, part of a process where I was starting to stitch together these kind of fragments of Kyoto to build this composite landscape of Kyoto um, in a similar way to how the original artists kind of stitched together different parts of Kyoto to create this composite landscape of Kyoto. And uh, kind of the first stage of the drawing was this, which is kind of a, I guess I guess a collage of these different moments and fragments of Kyoto that I kind of pulled together throughout my, my personal visit, my trip where I took loads of photographs, um, to then um, more zoomed out versions that uh, were outside of Kyoto um, done on Google Earth. So you can see it's the, this is ambiguous inside outside Kyoto title is about um, the slow process of being actually there and photographing and, and documenting my experience of the city, but also the kind of more remote, disembodied version of the city where I get from Google Earth. Um, which I then started to occupy, because I can't stop drawing, um, <laughs> uh, started to occupy as a space to draw in itself. So I started to, in the same way that my original paintings uh, extended and, and clamped onto the original clouds, you can see I've started to um, occupy the space of the drawing through CAD drawing that started to kind of uh, 
inhabit the spaces, but also um, to extend and, 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 and stitch together them through the drawing process. So these are still kind of work in progress, but um, it's part of a kind of ongoing kind of layered series of tracings, tracing from the, the scans and then the tracings as a collage and then the drawing inhabitation themselves. Um, and yeah, that's, that's kind of a work in progress. I mentioned briefly the Cartography of the Imagination project. And this is, I'm going to talk about really briefly because it's, uh, I uh, exhibited some of my work and, and curated this uh, festival of drawing, which happened a couple of years ago now, which in itself was, it was set in this um, greenhouse in, in London um, and collaborated with, uh, with Gloria Matto, who gave us these lovely pieces of drawings and, and worked with other artists and, 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 and similar map makers. Um, produced this lovely book, which was talking about drawing and, and the role of drawing in, in map making uh, and, and developing this kind of exhibition and forum where we really kind of tested out these ideas of drawing as a research technique and methodology. So it was not just a place for me to exhibit my drawings, but it was like a real discussion of drawing and how, um, how we inform and develop imaginations based on maps and, and, and other cartographic information that we have. So these are kind of the reference from, from drawing matter. Um, and we did a drawing workshop with students um, who <coughs> came from architecture backgrounds and non-architecture backgrounds at different levels of masters and under, undergrad who de developed a kind of collaborative drawing practice where they all responded to fragments from uh, drawing matter archives, but also the space of the, the, the exhibition itself to develop these um, landscapes and cartographies that responded to their own kind of group sense of drawing. So these are some extracts and some of the pieces that they've made um, in groups. And you can see how, for me, the drawing process becomes using the paintings as a site. And my kind of teaching in these uh, cases was about using other drawings as sites. So other drawings from drawing matter, but then also the collaborative process uh, in groups as well. So yeah, I think that's my experience of drawing. Does anyone have any questions? Philip. I'd like to know about how you actually did the drawings. I'm not sure if they're only the, the digital then hand traced. Mm. Um, yeah, so they're different. So this one, these are so the, the cloud drawing is actually a series of these A3s. So these are the original hand drawings uh, with pen and ink. Um, and then they were then done on a series of layers of A3s uh, using a light box and the original painting kind of underneath and me tracing and re-inhabiting and inventing the space by hand and then pulling it all together digitally to create that um, gold and black drawing essentially. So that was done sequentially. And then other drawings were drawn, uh, you know, using the photogrammetry scans, which is kind of um, digital scans, but then inhabited on, you know, just vector works, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, using CAD, um, CAD drawing there. But I move between uh, analog hand drawing and, and digital drawing because I see them as giving different things. So um, there's a slowness and there's a kind of uh, care of the scale of one to one that I do with, if something's important that it's the scale of the painting I draw with hand. Whereas the, the digital drawings are more about the reconstructions of the paintings and like the, for example, the, the model of the painting or the kind of the digital model of the scans creating a new uh, kind of surface but yeah there's a there's a big I, I kind of enjoy drawing at different in different means and modes so like I, I kind of have progressed from hand drawing into more digital things but it's not necessarily a progression it's more just a, a development of what the project's about so, so is that rotary pens? yeah yeah rotary pens <laughs> drawing board <laughs> Do you want line thicknesses? <laughs> it's 0 0.005, 0 0.13, and 0 0.25. Because you can do quite a lot through ink washes and yeah. brush type of pens. Mm. I imagine the Japanese thing is more brush. Yeah, yeah. Well, I did. I, I actually have got a whole other set of uh, studies where I used. Um, in fact, the first picture I showed, which I don't know if I can skip to, if I go really, really quick. Um, 
it's not a false impression, it's just a different <laughs> study that I haven't finished yet. Um, because I was really interested in Japanese painting uh, and how they actually created uh, pigments using natural uh, uh, minerals, so grinding natural minerals. Sorry, I'm skipping through the whole presentation here. Um, but this study here is, there you go. Um, so I, I played with gold as well. You can see some gold there. Um, so I played with gold leaf and actually making the gold leaf paste and using natural minerals to grind out the, and then using Japanese ink as well. But that's a whole another, you can see those on the floor. But it's not very really high res, I appreciate. But um, those aren't really finished yet, so um, uh, I kind of need to revisit that. But I did a whole course on, on miniature painting, like Persian miniature painting, because there's very similar, um, there's very similar techniques in that, uh, in how, in, 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 in Persian miniature painting, and there was, you know, this idea of the oblique representation and also the use of gold uh, and kind of um, gilding as well. Yes. You talk about all these different ways of drawing. Is that your approach is you, you don't see one face in another, you see them complementary? Is that true? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't. It, it's any drawing is like appropriate for whatever it's intending to kind of use, you know, whatever whatever the cause of the drawing is about. So, the digital techniques of drawing allow new things to be looked at, and the hand analog techniques allow for other things. So it's about what's appropriate, what's interesting, for the, what's, what, what is the, I guess, the process and what you're trying to get out of that process, I think. Um, so I don't shy away from using more digital techniques and I don't necessarily move away from using more analog techniques. I don't see them as uh, better or worse than the other. They just offer different, offer different perspectives. Seba. I'm curious, you, you mentioned <clears throat> Sorry, the constraints of different, you know, whether you're hand drawing as, as an analog process or your digital process, you mentioned the constraints of these techniques. As you're inhabiting these drawings through your designs, what are the other constraints that you face? And, mm. and you know, how, how do you respond to those in, in your sort of chosen yeah. sites? Well, my chosen, I guess in these drawings, um, I see it as a layer, well, a layering process. So each time, I revisit the something, I, I'm trying to find a new way of looking at it. So I'm building on from something. Um, so the constraints, I guess, are, I guess, the painting and the kind of the, the space of the painting and the scale of the painting. Um, and then also like the kind of difficulty of, of drawing, which is, what do you draw? Um, and a lot of other times, I guess, I can imagine students thinking, well, I've got a blank piece of paper and I don't know what to produce. And sometimes I think it's, that's why tracing I always found quite helpful for me as a student because with tracing, it's basically just redrawing something. You've drawn it once and you just try it again and you're trying to unlock something new in that space. And sometimes it gives you a, a really easy way of, of reimagining something without having to start with a blank piece of paper. And I think when you think about it, architecture never starts, starts off with a blank piece of paper. There's always context, there's always... Uh, program, there's always some kind of constraint there that you can build off from, and I think that's why I always used um, used a form of tracing. I say tracing because I see my my digital 3D scans. Those that's tracing. That's tracing a real place using a camera. Uh, it's me moving around the building and, and reoccupying that space. And when I build a digital 3D model of a painting, that's me tracing, but but tracing through extruding and building a, a kind of a constructed digital model that's still, it's just because it's a different tool doesn't mean it's still, it's not tracing. You're always building and working with something that's already there, but you're adding your own perspective, you're adding something new and each, that process of duplication is never like cloning, it's never photocopying, because you're always choosing where to start, you're always selecting how to start the drawing, how to move from the drawing, how to, and what to omit from the drawing as well. So there's always a selective process when you start doing that. Yes, sorry, <laughs> Augustus, yeah. Um, I like sort of that idea of almost uh, taking drawing as sort of a form of collage, so mm -hmm. drawing and tracing. Um, and I thought that the idea of sort of like the axonometric allowing for sort of the object and space to be sort of disem disembodied uh, from, I guess, the actual sort of space and idea of it. And I thought that it would be that the idea of sort of um, taking these moments 
and sort of, I guess, disconnecting them in actual space and then drawing in those missing parts mm -hmm. that are very interesting. And I wonder if there's like a way, of, I guess, applying that sort of, I guess, creating, I guess, imagining the connections between these moments and like actual, and creating new mm -hmm. design. No, absolutely. I mean, like, because uh, I guess it doesn't really come across as I'm not proposing a building to actually happen in these clouds of, of these paintings, obviously. So it is, but it's, it's, it's what we call a speculative architecture. But what it does do is it, what I can say about that is it, it teaches me a lot about the painting. Because a lot of the time you're spending to, to draw and inhabit that space, you're studying the painting in a, in a different way to than an art historian would be when they're just looking at it. So when you're tracing something, you're learning, you're kind of reenacting the original artist's uh, modus of, of, of the scale of their space, right? So you learn something fundamentally different because when you, what you're doing when you're re-collaging the spaces and re-projecting into the space and, or just reconstructing it through a digital model, you're learning and actually learn that most of those spaces don't make sense at all. Um, but it, you wouldn't notice it because when you're looking at it, it gives you this false impression of space kind of making sense. But when you start to reconstruct it as a digital model, you're like, hang on, this, this is completely you know, off the charts. It's not, but you know, so you learn about something. So you learn about architecture because the, you learn that in, in Japan, well, in Japan for this con context, architects didn't exist in the way they do, uh, where they did in the West where architects would design a building and then they draw it and then they give it to a craftsman and they build it. That didn't happen. What happened in Japan was craftsmen knew how to build architecture so architectural drawings only happened after they were built which meant they never had to be precise and they never had to be uh, um, given for for the purposes of construction so instead they were treated as more loose depictions of space and their identity so that's why that painting of Sanjay Kangendi temple which had the arches um, that long building it wasn't perfect it wasn't geometrically accurate because everyone knew it was that temple because it was long enough to be that temple. So it was more about the identity of a place through drawing rather than the actual precision of it. So you learn different things through that process and your, your, your architectural understanding is not about design and maybe it can be taken into design, but it's more about um, understanding how, informing how we imagine a place like a, like a city. In fact, most people haven't been to Kyoto, but they probably have a, an image in their mind's eye of what Kyoto is like because of films, because of images, because of things that we see, and that builds our own impression of, of a place, right? So that's, in a sense, what this, as, that's an architectural project in itself, like how we imagine space through our perception of it, through, through media. Uh, yeah. I don't know if I answered that question, but okay. Amy. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Yeah week of my PhD and it took about two years to finish. Not because I was working on it every day, but because I was like, oh my God, I'm really sick of this drawing. <laughs> and, and, I, and at some point I, was like, I just need to finish it now. But what you, you don't get, you don't get a shortcut in, in, this, in, in any process, right? So the, the time it took to do the drawing was so important. Even the boredom that resulted in the drawing, the, the act of being bored in drawing puts you into this, I guess it's kind of a hypnotic kind of phase of you're just in this world and the world you're in is of the drawing, of the design, of the painting and you can't think of anything else and then you, you kind of end up dreaming about it because it's just, and, but that you get something completely different and when you're immersed in that world for that long amount of time uh, and, and you're, and if I try to do this drawing now, even though I've done it, I spent the hours, I've done it already, it would be completely different and I would lose, I would have lost what I was like, wait, I've lost my 
momentum. I don't know how to do that drawing again because that's why I have to keep changing what I'm doing because I don't know how to do this drawing anymore because that only happened in the time of that process. And it happened like the first one, the first part of the drawing is actually this bit. And it's actually the worst part of the drawing. So this is the one I show because it's the first one time I had to break down how I did the drawing. And then, you know, my supervisor's like, great, now do it for the rest of the painting. <laughs> <laughs> so then I was like, okay, <laughs> kept on going. But as I kept on doing it, kept on getting better and more, I started to understand more about what I was doing. So the time is, is very much embedded. And also it's, it's not fair because the original artist had worked in teams. So I'm, I'm much one person, so, <laughs> but like, you know, this is, I did three panels of the painting, which is half of one of the paintings. So there's obviously two, so it's like a quarter of the, so thankfully I didn't have to do the whole six, well, 12 screens, I did three. But I think the time, the time embedded in any process is always rewarding because you, um, the, if you tried to find a shortcut to it, then it just wouldn't be what, it wouldn't have told me what it has told me, so. Related to the slowness that Harry Cooper talks about, it's yeah. slowness of reading, rereading, and, and drawing, which yeah. I think is quite fascinating. Yeah, especially when there's other forms of valid drawing that are really quick and impulsive mm -hmm. that tell you something completely different. Mm -hmm. But this, which tries to inhabit the detail and the precision, but also give my own voice to it as well, mm -hmm. um, was, yeah, something else. And in terms of precision, because of course here you are kind of tracing with hand and you can sort of draw the even a minute detail. When you have reconstructed uh, this digitally, mm. how much detail? Well, I did, I did. <laughs> so when I did the three dimensional deconstruction, you can see I took a bit of license with not putting too much detail in. Um, so that's the, de mm -hmm. that's the model. But I was mainly, mostly interested in the core architectural components because I was not really interested in uh, recreating the 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 kind of, I guess the appearance of the of the painting more about the the framing of space uh, and time and one of the things that was a big problem was the roofs so in these in the original painting all these roofs these pitch roofs when you draw an axle obviously you know the height of something because it goes across there and, and uh, across a certain height so it gives you the, these roofs look like they're they've got pictures, but if you actually look at it properly, like spatially, they've got no pictures at all because the angle that they go up is so small compared to the angle of where it should, the projection is, so that the pitch is basically flat. So it became quite interesting because you started to realize how some of these spaces are completely um, spatially incorrect, basically. But, um, but the details were there was just probably just about walls, f roofs, floors, there's some parts that ha have a bit more detail, but some parts that are really diagrammatic. But, yeah. Alex. When you build in the clouds, do you say that the artists were quite separate from the carpenters who designed the building? Yeah. Do you bring in your own like, knowledge of how the construction of these buildings was like, expressed mm -hmm. in the clouds, or did you kind of continue the language of the artists? I, I continue the language of the artists, so the very much was building on the so I was very much like learning about the typology of the architecture through what was being represented. For example, these moments here, these screens, and then like the, the typology of the material houses, which is very kind of these fragmented kind of orthographic kind of uh, shutters and, and screens and stuff, became a part of the typology. So I'd introduce things that were, I found elsewhere in the painting, but also completed the things. So I completed the things, you know, for example, this tower, it shows the top of the tower, but it doesn't say how big it is, so I just made it really <laughs> tall. But it's just basically copying and completing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yes? I was just wondering uh, which drawing out of the ones you, you've shown is your favourite. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone likes the cloud drawing, but it's the first one I did, so it's kind of annoying. <laughs> but yeah, I don't have a favourite. All of it, I, I always put work in progress because I imagine that at one point I'll have the time and space to just devote myself to finishing. I think the cloud drawing is pretty much, I think I can put that away, but 
This one here, uh, the Sanjay Sangendra Temple, I, I don't think it's finished at all. It's just kind of a study. And then this one here is really underdeveloped because um, it's just the starting point. But then, uh, and then the, these studies, you can see they're not finished in terms of the gilding. Um, actually, these do have um, Japanese ink, Philip. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, these are these are very un unfinished pieces, but I kind of I'm kind of happy for them to remain unfinished. I don't need to finish them. So, but, yeah. great. Is that all? Well, thank you very much. <laughs>